Good morning. It's good to see you all today. Glad you're here. I know I have a bunch of children at heart out there too yet. I like to bring my teddy bear along with me when I talk to you guys about different things. And this is the one I usually bring. He's a pretty good-looking teddy bear, isn't he? Got nice dark eyes and, and a pretty nose. He's got, a, he's got a tie on too. Isn't that neat? He's a pretty good-looking guy all in all. Today I brought somebody else with me too, though. I brought another bear along. This guy is a little bit of a problem. He's got kind of a flat nose. His head doesn't stand up very well. There's a little hole over here. He used to have a string. You could pull that string and he'd go, grrr. There's a hole over here. and Kind of all in all, he doesn't look all that great. Which one of these two teddy bears would you like? The big, the big one. I'm not surprised. You know, that helps us to understand some things, doesn't it? Because I want to tell you about this teddy bear. This is my teddy bear when I was little. He would be with me when I was scared during thunderstorms. He would be with me when I was scared in the dark. He would sleep on my bed and help me stay calm. He's old and he looks kind of flat and worn out, but he's special too, just like this teddy bear. That's how God wants us to see people. He doesn't want us to look at the outside and say, well, that one looks kind of funny and frumpy. He doesn't dress very well. Maybe he's dirty or she has uh, some torn clothes or something like that. Instead, he wants us to look at each person as Jesus' special guest. He died for everyone, including those that don't always look so good. So when we see them, we want to invite them to be with us, to share Jesus' love for them as well, and to be a part of their lives, just like they'll be a part of ours. Let's pray about that. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and looking at a person like me and saving me. Thank you for coming for everyone. Help us to remember that so that when we see anyone, no matter who it is, we remember that they are your special people, that you died for them as well. And help us to bring the message as well as good things to them as they need them. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Matthew chapter 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to, not to call the righteous, but sinners. This is God's word. You may be seated. <clears throat> Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord your brothers and sisters in Christ. Do you remember that window into the human condition that most of you have experienced? Some are in the midst of and some are yet to experience it, but most of you have experienced. Some it's long ago, some it's not that far from your memory. It's the, it's the high school cafeteria, so, or the middle school cafeteria. You enter in and you're faced with a decision. You're faced with a, a rush of emotions. Where do I sit? Who do I sit with? You know, do I sit on that table with the, the athletes or the, or the nerds or, the, or the, the cool girls, the mean girls, the, the leaders, the losers? And you have to make a decision because it's very important, or at least it seems so at the time. And what's that all about? It's about image, isn't it? It's about how you want people to view you, who you want to be seen with. When people think of you, who do they think of or what do they think of? And so it becomes something so kind of all-consuming. And sometimes maybe you've been the, the person who's on the, on the one end where you're shutting people out and you don't want to be seen with them. And on the other side, maybe you're the person sometimes who nobody sits with or you feel left all alone. And maybe you've been both places and it just depends on the day or the hour. And we like to think we outgrow this difficulty that we have and rushing through these, these things in our thoughts and our, our minds, and, but yet it, it doesn't stop. You know, the, the boss invites you out to dinner or to spend some time or to go someplace, and you think, I'm going to clear my schedule 
because this is the person that can promote me, this is the person that can make my life easier, versus maybe that awkward or overzealous coworker um, inviting you to spend some time together. You know, one of those maybe you'd rather do more than the other, or you think is more important than the other. And then you think of um, the different, um, the different people you run into and, and, and maybe a leader in the community wants to spend some time with you. Pick your brain on some things. You're like, wow, that's, yeah, I want to do that. And then maybe there's that, that person in your life who just can never get their life together. and They want to spend time and pick your brain. You're like, I just don't have time for that. Um, the Lord, in God's word for us today, uncovers a couple things in our hearts and in the human condition, but also in our sinful hearts. Fear and pride. And he shows us what a God-lived life is. In our series that's been going on these, these past three months, and we'll have one month more, it's, it's a God-lived life. That Jesus lived a perfect God-lived life in our place for us. And he credited that life to us before his Father so that you and I might live and are freed to live a God-lived life out of thanks for all he's done for us. And so today we, we look at what Jesus teaches us, that a God-lived life is a life of hospitality. A God-lived life is a life of hospitality. Here are now just the first few verses of our, of our scripture reading for today. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Jesus did something, maybe a little countercultural, maybe something that was a little crazy, but then you think about it, and Jesus was always doing stuff like this. And for a very excellent purpose. Jesus goes and eats with sinners. And it goes even beyond that. Even before that, he goes and talks to this tax collector, Matthew. Now, we don't think too much of the IRS. We don't necessarily like letters from the IRS or the, you know, a phone call from the IRS. And I'm not talking about the 80 scams where the police are on their way and you have to give them their social security number. Don't do those. Don't answer those. The IRS loves you, but they don't love you enough to call you, you know, so just don't. It's not them. Um, but you think about that. We don't have as bad of a thing, but nobody like, you know, likes that because it's going to... But tax collectors in Jesus' day were really seen as the scum of the earth because as a Jew... You, first of all, did not like that the Romans had taken and taken over control of your city, of your area, even your temple, and you just, you wanted them off, you wanted them gone. But some from your own number decided to work for the Romans and collect taxes and tariffs and customs. And, and so not only did they do this because it was a job, they also had the habit of charging you more than was necessary to make themselves rich upon what they were already getting. And so this became synonymous with greed. This came synonymous with, with graft, with, with taking advantage of their fellow mankind and working for the enemy. And so they were really, they were, many of them were not allowed in the synagogue, you know, one of their kind of local places of worship. Rabbis would encourage you to stay away from the tax collectors. And here Jesus goes and he calls Matthew. You know, he goes to the to the tax collector's booth. He had just gotten done um, teaching in a house. It was so packed full of people and supporters and people wanted to hear him that if you wanted to get to Jesus, you had to do what four, four or a few friends did for their friend. They, uh, they took off roof tiles and they lowered their paralyzed friend before Jesus and Jesus forgave his sins. And then he said, you know, because they doubted whether he could forgive sins or not, he said, get up, take your mat and go. Now Jesus leaves that place and he heads for Matthew the tax collector. And, you know, most times you go through those booths and you don't even make eye contact, you just whatever, and you go through. But Jesus goes and he searches him out at his job and he sees him more than just a, as the scum of the earth, more than just a man, more than just a worker at a toll booth. He, he sees him as a soul that needs a relationship with his Father in heaven. And Jesus gives him one with that simple invitation, come or follow me, follow me. Now, was Jesus just doing his job, you might ask? You know, like, this is what he was sent to do, so he had to do this, you know? There are people that you'd rather not be nice to, but because you're at work and you're paid to be there and to do this, you are nice to people. And so, even though you might not like to be, you have to be nice to them because you get paid to do it. And if you aren't nice to them, then you quickly probably will not be 
paid anymore. So um, you do that, and you because you have to. You probably would not invite them over. You probably would not want to spend time with them outside of you know just that interaction at work or whatever it was. But what does Jesus do? He goes and he he doesn't just take Matthew from the tax collector's booth and say say goodbye to everything, come with me. No, he actually goes to Matthew's house, spends time with him, and even his friends, these tax collectors. And sinners, and it wasn't just, you know, maybe Jesus was just trying to, you know, expand the group and diversify his group of followers. Maybe he just needed someone who was good with the books. Maybe he just needed someone who didn't smell like fish. Maybe he just wanted to, you know, expose them to, you know, or get access to a demographic of society he hadn't touched yet. But no, he sits there and he, he goes to Matthew's house. He eats with him. He eats with tax collectors and sinners. And Matthew invites them because not only is Jesus for him, he knows Jesus is for the world and he wants them to have a relationship with their Father in Heaven, too. He goes to great lengths, and Jesus goes to great lengths in this hospitality of time, of, of place, of all these things, so that people have a relationship with their Lord. What lengths would you go to? Uh, Mr. Benzine read the, the lesson from, from Genesis, and we see Abraham insisting, begging these strangers who are passing by to stay with him. And not just that, like, hey, here's my leftovers, or... No, he has, you know, Sarah gets busy to work 93 cups of flour, I think is the, the equivalent of nowadays, gets to work doing what she had to do to bake that and make this nice feast. And, and Abraham selects this nice calf from the herd, his own expense, and has the servants, you know, slaughter it, um, butcher it, roast it, get it ready. And then what does Abraham do? He stands there, like, serving them, waiting on them. The Greek word for hospitality is philozenia, or Zania, it's um, Philo, Philos, uh, Phila, Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, Philos, love, and Zania, stranger. It's a love of strangers. You know, what lengths do we go to? The difficulty sometimes is sometimes we're in the mood for hospitality, sometimes we're not in the mood for hospitality, sometimes it's our fear or our pride getting in the way of what would be hospitality. You know, think, think of our excuses for spending time with people or for having people into our lives or into our homes. And isn't it, oh, my house is way too messy. And, you know, sometimes that's legit. Like, you can't even walk through it. I mean, sometimes not everyone's children are, are that great at helping pick up after themselves and not all of us are that great at picking up after ourselves. But sometimes isn't that a little bit of fear? What are people going to think of me? What are people going to, you know, they see that I don't have my life together and so I can't invite them in. Um, or maybe it's pride. Maybe it's, you know... Yeah, that'd be nice, but I'm just too busy. You know, I'm swamped. And really, you know, maybe it's just that we'd rather not spend time with that person. Or we don't have time for that person. Or we don't have time um, because we'd rather reserve that time for better people than this or that person. You know, sometimes that is pride getting in the way. And then you think of it, and didn't Jesus have better places to be than heading for a tax collection booth to talk to a tax collector? which most of society would say you shouldn't talk to because they're awful people. Weren't there better people to hang out with than eating with tax collectors and sinners? But then the mirror gets put in front of your face and my face, and doesn't Jesus have better places to be than where two or three are gathered in New Ulm in his name? Here. Doesn't he have better people he could spend time with than you and me, sinners? And we know the answer to that. Yeah, he does. But Jesus does a marvelous thing. He wants to spend time with you. In fact, he's, we know he's done far more than that. He made himself the stranger so that you and I could be called sons and daughters of God. He made himself the stranger so that God would look on us and accept us. He made himself the stranger when he took upon himself all of our sins, all of our pride, all of our fear, all of our excuses, all of our failures, all the guilt and shame we carry. He took it all upon himself. Everything that was punishable by God with an eternity in hell, he took upon himself, and he became the stranger on the cross. He cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God turned his back. He closed the door on Jesus because that's what you and I deserved. And Jesus suffered hell for you and me. And on the cross, he said, it is finished. He gave up his life. His God-lived life of hospitality that he lived perfectly for you and for me so that God would accept us and call us his sons and daughters 
And that is what he does. You are forgiven. You are freed. You are his. Jesus rose from the grave to prove it to you. That nothing can separate you from God's love. He changed Matthew, didn't he? I mean, Matthew invited all these tax collectors and sinners over his house to, to meet Jesus. Then he followed Jesus. And, and he, was more, he was known more than just Matthew the tax collector. You know, what do, we, what do we think of him now as? Okay, stained glass window tour of St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Um, if you look over there, um, right up from you, Steve, you got to kind of don't strain your neck. If you did your stretches this morning, you can look. But, I mean, who is that? That's, uh, that's John, right? Gospel writer. And then who's over there? Who's over there? Um, Chris, do you see who's kind of in the purple robe? Um, Luke over there. And uh, Haley, who's in the blue? Matthew, the gospel writer. He's not got a money bag. He's got a pen and paper, and he's writing the gospel, writing the very story, the very truths that he wanted to pass on of what Jesus did for him that Jesus has also done for you. He changed Matthew to be a child of God. And don't worry, Mark is out in the hallway because of the rebuild, the remodel. He's out there. We didn't forget Mark. But don't forget that Jesus has also changed you. Through your baptism, he's called you his child washed you clean of your sin, robed you in Christ's righteousness. He invites you to eat with him and dine at his table as he gives you his body and blood and the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper for your forgiveness. So you do not doubt, but you know this is for you, for your forgiveness, and you are loved by God. What amazing grace, what amazing mercy, what hospitality. A God-lived life is a life of hospitality that Jesus lived for us, that he, that he gave to the Father in our place so that we could be accepted and that he sets us free to live out of thanks to him for everything he's done. And sometimes pride and fear still get in the way. The, the, the Pharisees, what, did they, what were they chirping at Jesus for? And they didn't have the guts to go to Jesus, but they went to the disciples, and they say to him, you know, why does your, why does your master, why does your rabbi eat with tax collectors and sinners? Doesn't he know who they are? Doesn't he know he has better places to be? Or he shouldn't even be eating with them. They're the scum of the earth. And what does Jesus say to them? Just shuts down that argument in their minds and their hearts and your minds and our hearts. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Where do we want our doctors and our nurses and our frontline medical workers and staff to be? You know, out in the waiting room with the, the healthy people or out in the parking lot waiting to hear what happens? No, we want them in the emergency room. We want them in the ICU. We want them in with our loved ones who are sick and suffering and to help them, to heal them. Realize God has made you the frontline workers of his kingdom, the doctors, the nurses, the, the, the medical workers. And he sends us out to be amongst those who are hurting, to be amongst those who are, who are lost, who are the sick, who don't know their Savior, who don't have a relationship with Jesus. So that through you, by your hospitality, God can use that to introduce more people to our God and our Savior. We don't often argue people into heaven. Actually, we never really do. Apologetics definitely has its place, and we can shut down arguments which are false and illogical. However, it's the gospel that is the power of, the God for the sal power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And you have that. And oftentimes, even though you'd first like to speak it to someone, they often see it in the way you speak, in the way you live, in the hospitality you show. Like Matthew did. As you invite more people as you open up your family so that more and more people might meet your Father in heaven. And that's what Jesus said. He said, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He calls us to live a God-lived life because that's what he's given us. We, have, we want more and more people at that wonderful table to sit with us. And I'm not talking about that 30 to 40 minute lunch hour with plastic trays with little dividers and things like that and the silverware. As good as our cafeterias are, our God wants us to be around his table in the glorious banquet with our Savior Jesus for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen.